Welcome to the seventh edition of Starmer's 108 minute panel discussion. I've been thinking if I have to introduce our panelists by their profession, by names, etc., and, and then I thought, okay, I can, I can mention who they are, but I shouldn't say what they have done and their accomplishment because I thought you cannot watch 108 minute discussion if you don't know names of people who are here today. So I will just simply say that we have Pietro Barabashi, we have Laurie Anderson, we have Dexter Holland, we have Jane Goodall, Tony Faddle, Stephen Chu, Catherine Hayo, and Chris Hatfield. So I'm not going to say who they are. So I, I assume, <laughs> I assume that everyone knows them. So what is 108 minutes? 108 minutes was the duration of first human space flight by Yuri Gagarin. And, um, and that has changed the world. And it was the beginning of a space race. And according to Alexei Leonov, who was a member of our advisory board for a while, it was the best race in a human history. That was a race for technology, for bringing science where it, uh, where it is, but it was not a race for military, it was not a war. So space race has changed the world, and this 108 minute has changed the world. But the first discussion about 108 minutes and the first lecture at Starmus was quite interesting, was given by Brian May, and it was titled, What Are We Doing in Space? So Brian posted this question, and everyone was expecting that he's going to say, how amazing is what we are doing, etc. But he actually posted a question in a way that, what are we doing in space? Are we going to space for to build military bases on the moon? Why are we going to to Mars? Are we going to Mars for scientific exploration, or we are going to Mars to pollute Mars in about 50 years to make it as bad as we have our own planet? So that was a question. And uh, everyone, to my surprise, Neil Armstrong agreed with Brian completely. And he even mentioned, he cited Brian May in his talk, saying that Brian is right. So unless we change our character, unless we change, it's very dangerous for humanity to explore further, to go to Mars or to return to the moon. So it was very interesting. It was very much in the spirit of Starmus. Yeah. So we have to make sure what are we doing? Why are we going to space? Now, we, we, we are already in a space race, too. And we are already talking about going, returning to Mars. We return to the moon. But what's going to happen with this return to the moon? What is the next stage? So um, this panel discussion about global problems that humanity is facing today. Uh, then, first question I want to start, probably the most important, is about climate change. So everyone is talking about climate change. It's here. Are we going, what's going to happen with humanity? Can we avoid, can we survive? Can we survive a climate change? And we have Catherine Hayhoe to start a discussion on climate change. Please, Catherine, what do you think? Can we survive? What we have to do to survive? Is it too late? Or we have two years, mm -hmm. 10 years? There's no magic number. But we know that the further we push this planet beyond where it should be, the greater the risks. And the challenges right now, the greatest challenges are not scientific although there are scientific challenges. The greatest challenges are not technical, although there are technological challenges. The greatest challenges are human will. Do we recognize the risk? Will we do what it takes to avoid the end of civilization as we know it? Will life survive? Yes. Will some humans survive? Yes. The question is, will we as a civilization? And so people often ask me, how do we save the planet? And my answer is, it's not about saving the planet. The planet will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. It's about saving us. Can we save us? That question is up to us. We are the ones who have to make that decision. 
And so that's why, I, although I'm a scientist, I originally began at, in astronomy and physics and atmospheric science. Now, so much of what I do is trying to share with people why it matters to them, to their life, to their home, to their children, to the place they live, to the job that they have, and what solutions look like, because we have so many solutions in our hands already today. That was Steve's talk. There are so many solutions we could be implementing today that not only address climate change, they also address health. They address access to food and water. They address issues of socioeconomic inequality and poverty. They address issues of biodiversity and conservation. There's so many win-win-win solutions we could be implementing today for a better world. And what we lack the most is the human will. You mean political will? Yes. The political will. Political will. So well, we, don't, we do know that humans can do something if they choose to. We saw what happened with COVID. The world changed in six weeks, eight weeks. The whole place changed. We even went down with our, our, you know, our CO2 intensity went down for a little while. Mm -hmm. So we can have the will. There's not a question of <laughs> can we. It's will we actually do it again? Isn't it interesting for chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere, they weren't an immediate threat to anybody. Nobody, yeah, there was the ozone layer was getting thinner, but nobody was like personally feeling the pinch of that. And yet, we managed to get together in Montreal mm -hmm. and agree, even though it's not a short-term threat, it's a threat to the entire world, and we have a solution, and let's all agree, and we signed the accord, and we fixed it. We, we, so we can, I agree with you. If, if, if we somehow can gather ourselves collectively to recognize that this is a common threat, we can find ways to solve it. And it's just a matter of scale and how it is that politicians and people see the problem uh, and, and what their part might be in finding the solution. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Chlorofluorocarbon, DuPont said, we know what to do. We'll share it with, okay, it's inexpensive climate change, every sector of the economy, every sector it touches. And so this is, this is the problem. So, so here's the thing. And so we, many people talk about starting with Jane Goodall. And so, and here's the thing about human will and human thing. Um, we, in our DNA, are aggressive. Yet, we have history. We can talk to each other and we can court history and for hundreds and thousands of years. And so we need to learn from our history mm -hmm. how important it is, how to say, no, don't make the same mistake over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And this is the most important part. We can communicate over generations, over hundreds of years, over millennia. And so, so I think, and this is one of my cartoons, I said, mm -hmm. this is the most important things. Those who don't know history are condemned to repeat it. Those who know history are condemned to watch people who don't know history repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, so this human compassion, which I do believe is in part of all of us, okay? But we have to remind ourselves that we can do this, but you have to figure out how to tap the human compassion. Exactly. How do you make it desirable? And from history, though, we know that we have seen major societal changes. The abolition of slavery, women getting the vote, civil rights being enacted, the end of yeah. apartheid. Those were huge societal changes that had profound economic and sectoral implications, yet they changed because individuals used their voices to advocate for change. And I did the most unspeakable thing. I cut off Jane. <laughs> 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 so, um, I was simply going to say that people seem not to understand that we are part of the natural world. Mm -hmm. And not only we are part of the natural world, but we actually depend on it for food, water, air, everything. And, you know, when I think about climate change, initially, people didn't care in the, in the Western, you know, developed world. It's, oh, it's affecting Bangladesh. It's affecting the little islands out in the Pacific. Well, you know, but now, now, and it's bad news, but in a way it's good news, it's affecting the developed nations. Mm -hmm. 
It's affecting New York, it's affecting uh, Washington, it's affecting London, it's affecting, you know, it's not just the developing world that it's affecting. And it's, uh, I, I'm hoping that that is going to make some impact on the politicians who so far have been, oh, oh maybe on biz, big business, because mm. big business, you know, it's got vested interests and it doesn't want to change mm. the way it works. So what's going to change big business, which right now has a, has a very, very unholy alliance with politics and, of course, with the military? So what's going to change it? It can only be we, the people. Mm -hmm. It can only be the young people mm -hmm. that I work with traveling around the world. It's got to be us that... that it's just, I don't know, I, I get very upset and worked up about it because we have the tools, you've just said so, we know how, how to do it, but where is the will mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you are up fighting against these vested interests of these huge corporations who don't want to change? Why do you have governments subsidizing oil and gas mm -hmm. and not clean renewable energy? Because there's corruption. Mm -hmm. It's money, money, money. Everything comes down to money. It's That's all about what we money. got to change. It's all about money. And I was very moved by your talk as well. I spent a week with Dalai Lama. And when you were talking about this and meditation, and so I learned that the whole Buddhist Tibetan philosophy was don't separate you from the rest of the world. You are one. This is very, very deep. Because if you humans, rest of the world, we're special, we, you know, we have a special ego to be sure. But the real deep philosophy is we are so much part of the world and do not separate yourself from the rest of the world. I find that very encouraging, the number of people who are learning meditation and learning exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Because uh, what we're talking about is how to alert the world to this and um, I wish we could figure that out because it's, um, uh, with many movements, it's the threat of death, COVID, or for, for us, <clears throat> and I'm just saying us because I, I recently visited my university in New York, which was completely closed. All the gates were shut and um, police were there and there was no graduation because the students had um, been uh, voicing their opinions about the wars in the world. And I was thinking back to the time 56 years ago when I was in the same building, chained to the other students um, and arrested by the police and dragged off. And I'm thinking, I'm ruining my life. You know, what am I doing this for? And um, then now I have the advantage of looking back at those years and thinking, guess what? Civil rights movement came out of that. Anti-war student, mm -hmm. the students today are mm -hmm. saying things. and and using their voices to say, first, let's stop the war. Then, then we can figure out some ways that we can look at things. And um, so I, I find that really encouraging, that it does actually matter that you, what you say and what you do. And while at the time you think, oh, this is crazy, it's, um, in retrospect, uh, changes the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm hoping Starmus is a, is a way to <laughs> having people <laughs> just say, Okay, we, we really have to, to I mean, I, I came here and, and it's so encouraging to s hear all of you speak because I'm, I'm a much more pessimistic person, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so to hear this optimism is making me so happy. You know, well, the situation is, well, we are facing now a world war train. It's a real danger. Do you think, well, are you optimistic that we're going to recover from this? Or I'm do you think completely so? bimodal. I need lithium. <laughs> so, so here's the optimistic side. The optimistic side is, well, humans will come to common sense. And once we have common sense, we have the intellect and the will to invent the solutions we, we need and to use the solutions we have. That's the optimistic side but it takes a social conscience. The mm -hmm. pessimistic side is exactly what Jane said. 
big money, captured by big money, mm -hmm. uh, the internet, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. captured by big money. Mm -hmm. These companies were very smart. Mm -hmm. They hired the children of Chuck Schumer, leader in the Senate. Mm -hmm. So they get captured. And this, Regulatory this uh, committee, there were, you know, it was all big internet companies. And so, so how do we do this? So it, we live in a democracy. We have to say that this is what's happening. The people should speak out. So that's the pessimistic side. But I will go back and say reflexively, the optimism is in my heart because if you give up hope, you've given up your children, your grandchildren, and their children and grandchildren. So mm -hmm. you cannot not hope. Here, yeah, yeah. here. <laughs> that's <laughs> my mission. <laughs> to go around the world giving hope because if we lose hope we're doomed mm -hmm. if our children lose hope we're doomed mm -hmm. and how can we possibly bring a child into this world and tell that child well sorry darling i mean you know i brought you here but there's no hope for the future mm -hmm. i can't do that I'm going to, I don't want to monopolize this thing. So I talked to the Senate, and then these other people should chime in. And I said, so a small group of senators, <clears throat> imagine you're 10 years, 20 years in the future, because the senators are old. Uh, you're on your deathbed. You're surrounded by your loved ones, your family, your grandchildren. A granddaughter comes up and says, Grandpa, you are in a position to do something you didn't. Didn't you love me? I said that once, and my chief of staff said, don't ever do that again. Hmm. Why not? Because it makes him feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so Tony. back to your question on war. And I'm hopeful. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a very, very hopeful and optimistic person. I have to be <laughs> for what I do. But um, I think on the question of war, we also have to redefine what war is. I think we've, we grew up, some of us grew up, lived through all kinds of physical wars, whether there was land, sea, air, what have you. We have a war, and we have been having a war between all kinds of different entities, and that's been a cyber war. And no one really understands that we have been in World War III for a couple of decades now on the internet. That's a war for mines, a war for you know espionage. It's a war for all kinds of things. And those are more, and I think, are more powerful wars and actually easier to fight and at a massive scale than the physical wars we see today. Of course, people are dying, and that's absolutely wrong. There's, it's, we, physical wars are horrible, but we do have another war and it has been brewing and brewing and, and it's happening everywhere and no one's really admitting it yet. We see how many people's identities are stolen, how much money is stolen. We see governments being changed because of it and we need to make sure we understand that that is a new type of war in, within this new te technological society that we have and we can't ignore it because these physical wars, these governments, all of these things are changing because of the cyber wars that are going on. And so we need to make sure we're fighting the right things, not the symptoms, but going after the root cause. Yeah. But, but can I just add, we're also having a war against nature. I fully agree. Yep. That's, a, that's another a, that great war. You, and also, you know, the other thing about these, these horrible wars that are causing so much suffering, they are creating vast amounts of greenhouse gas going up into, sure. the, into the atmosphere. They're causing the destruction of forests because like Vietnam, and that's also releasing CO2. And so it's all, that's the whole thing about today. Everything's interconnected. Mm -hmm. And if we want to solve one problem, we have to think about the others. We have to think holistically. And we've got enough people with enough brains and enough know-how to get together and talk about all the different problems and try and solve them together. Jane, how do the chimpanzees resolve conflict? Chimpanzees, <laughs> I mean, well, you know, uh, it seems that about six million years ago, human chimps separated. And um, Louis Leakey sent me to study the chimps because he said, I think 
If you see ch behavior in chimps today, similar or same as human today, probably that was in a common ancestor mm -hmm. six million years ago. And there are so many similarities. And one, shockingly and horrifyingly, chimpanzees can be violent. They have a kind of primitive war, which is like the original, you know, indigenous wars over territory. But we've gone beyond that. Well, but operation. do they have a methodology for resolving conflict? They don't know. They kill each other. Yeah, and right. then they take mm -hmm. over the territory. So what we need then, we can't rely on our nature. In fact, we no. have to go against our nature <laughs> but, to but resolve conflict. But we've got this intellect right. that makes but, us but more different. But it's against different. our fundamental nature. So then how do you make something that is against our nature appealing enough that we are willing to make that choice? To me, that's the fundamental issue. How do we go against common human but, nature but and make it desirable? Don't you think most people don't want war? Well, it's easy to say, but will they make the personal choices? Will they actually behave <laughs> differently like they don't for climate change? Yes, I'm against climate change, but I'm still going to drive my Hummer, no. you know? <laughs> and so how do you give people the desirable individual choice motivation so that they will go against their nature for the collective good of all. To me, that's the, with the core the kids. issue. The kids. You work with the kids. We can communicate through generations. Mm -hmm. Chimpanzees cannot. We can have history. Mm -hmm. They do not. And yeah. so it's the cumulative knowledge of history collective that will, the collective knowledge that is our hope. Yeah. When, when in history did that prevent war? Never. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> so I disagree with you. <laughs> so so I, um, one of the organizations I work with that studies human nature to try to answer this exact question is called Potential Energy. And they completed a global survey last year where they asked people, 70% of the world's population, they asked, mm. what would motivate you to act on climate? Hmm. And what you might have expected is maybe to find some different answers depending on where people lived in richer countries and not as rich countries and different continents. And instead, what the researchers found was a very powerful single reason that motivated everyone around the world to care. And that motivation was love, especially love of the next generation. Hmm. Yeah. You and can't that's give up hope. The, the, oh. um, <laughs> the, what we're saying to, to, to children is like, okay, we didn't do such a great job, but you are going to fix it. And um, as a kid, I was never asked to fix the world. Mm -hmm. It's a lot to ask a kid mm -hmm. to say, over to you now. But you know, when I saw these kids singing last night, I was like, they're up for it. You know, they've got mm -hmm. incredible energy. So I agree with you that if you can. Um, uh, teach them, uh, actually I love the meditation uh, um, classes that are now happening in some schools in the United States. They are, and it is about, my life is your life, and your life is my life, and we really have to think that way, not just what am I going to get out of it. So I think if we can teach people that, we have something of a chance, and not putting it all on them to go, you solve it, no. <laughs> but very important. Don't separate people from the rest of the world. This yeah. is what I learned yeah. from Dalai Lama. It's, yeah. it's just one thing. Yeah. Yes. We are not going to separate ourselves from nature. We're not going to separate ourselves from animals and even cockroaches. You do that. Well, maybe cockroaches. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we just agree that pandemic is a great example that we can get together immediately in a very short time scale solve things right mm -hmm. and pandemic was i mean there was hiv before and i know dexter did some research on this yes. right yes so how you were you know you were dealing with in a short time scale to 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 explore yes nature. well i mean we've had pandemics before of course the flu pandemic of 1918 this isn't a new thing necessarily but you know i think what's what's different now is the social media of it the communication of it i kind of think that's a problem. Um, it's not like, you know, Jonas Salt coming up with the polio vaccine and everyone says hooray. You know, I think now we have technological advances, but it's not enough to have the advance. You have to sell it. Like you actually have to convince people that this is a good thing. And that's a, a real difference 
from how it was to say a generation ago. And I think it's a really important topic to, uh, to attack is the communication of the thing. Yeah. yeah. There is a, but, sorry. Go ahead. But with, with pandemics, I mean, one of the major problems is the, the transfer of viruses from animals to people. Mm -hmm. And as we invade deeper and deeper and deeper into the habitat of wildlife, then, and, and these wet markets in Asia, and the, the horrible traffic of animals around the world, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. means there's more and more and more opportunities of viruses jumping from one animal to one person. And if they bond or whatever it is that they do, um, then you can have a new pandemic. And we're getting closer and closer to that. And we're getting more and more um, resistance to antibiotics because of the misuse of antibiotics in animal husbandry, right? Absolutely. The wet markets, they think, are uh, a source of what they call zoonotic transmission yeah. or whatever. And, uh, 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 you know, it, it, it appears that HIV originated from uh, butchering of the monkeys. Uh, Chim chimpanzees chimps, yeah. in two parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. Separate, separate events. It looks HIV like HIV one, HIV two. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. a matter of history. There was a difference between 1918 Spanish flu, which is labeled American Spanish flu, and uh, this one. The vector was the end of the war. People went home. The vector now is jet travel. It's yeah. profoundly better. It's spreading. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a a much better vector. Yeah. Can spread very quickly, for yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one, I mean, isn't it scary that one, one animal gives one virus to one person, and now, unlike the old days, it can just go round and round and round. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quickly, right. Quickly, because right, of right. air travel. Yeah, I mean, HIV kind of simmered for a long time, yeah. right, you know, in, in Africa and stuff before it finally took hold, uh, through jet travel, it, it looks yeah. like, right? Yeah. yeah. And there's another looming thing. I forget what it was, H1N5, it's anyway. There's a, a virus that, when caught in mammals, is 9% fatal. And it spread to humans, but it didn't transmit. And everybody's, all the health people are watching if this becomes as infectious as COVID, as measles. It's a virus. We are not going to have a vaccine the way we had COVID with a very good marker. We may not. Yeah. Not to Too cheer true. you up. <laughs> <laughs> and most of us flew here. <laughs> we're, we're the vectors. Yeah, but the pandemic was a, a very good example how we fail in bringing science to society. Because when social media exploded with things like they said, microchips of Bill Gates and Microsoft sending so vaccination is a complete failure and that the stuff that I was really amazed. So how people actually 21st century could believe in this. And there were so celebrities and people really posting those things that don't get vaccinated because this is all rubbish and you go, it's really mm -hmm. surprised. And basically we fail, really. We have to bring science to society go with right. respect to science and then well s to be truthful right people have been talking about pandemics possible pandemics for a decade or more before covid <laughs> and we need to prepare this is a, a this is an eventuality not a is it likely it's going to happen it's just a matter of when and we you know everyone said ah yeah we'll get around to that one day <laughs> right and then <laughs> oh, and then we got around to it real fast so I hope we don't, you know, I, I'm unfortunately have um, <clears throat> looking at companies, looking at people, looking at societies and everything. Unfortunately, the way I look at it is people don't really change until they have a near death yeah. mm. incident. Of course they do. Yeah. You know, they change their health <laughs> when <laughs> they've had their close to death, when they've gone through that thing. And so I just hope we don't get there with the climate. Well, how about um, electric cars? Because uh, the best selling car in the world was the Model Y last year. Sure. Uh, and no one had a near-death experience that made them buy the Model Y. They bought the Model Y, even though the batteries aren't great yet, the range isn't very good, there's a lousy infrastructure system for them, it's not a cheap car, and yet, we collectively, for some reason, 
decided that was the most desirable car in the entire world last year. So how can we use that model of making, because that's what Elon was trying to do. We have to electrify if we're going to survive as a species. So how can I make people want yeah. to electrify mm -hmm. rather than the government saying, you know, we need you to take uh, your coronavirus shot. How do you make it cool and desirable <laughs> for people to give us the future that we want so we can deny our chimpanzee fundamental nature, which is not shaped that way. We have to appeal to the higher intellect and make people want those things. It, and I think is, the Model it Y is, it is, is it cool to buy an electric car. Yeah. It is cool. Yeah, but why? <laughs> yeah, because it is cool. Because I agree. <laughs> that's, that's right. The fact of the matter is that buying an electric car doesn't make you pollute less. What makes you pollute less is if the electric car sure. doesn't use as the source, original source of, of energy, fossil fuel. But you got to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, but you don't start that way. Oh, if I you think start, you do. Because yeah, otherwise nothing gets done. If you start that way, in my perspective, you create an alibi. I don't know a lot of people that feel very content with themselves because they drive an electric car. They yeah. don't mind the fact that the electricity which is produced to drive their car comes from coal. Yeah, but so, so how do you suggest solving it then? <laughs> so the, 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 the electric car per se is, can be interpreted as an alibi from my perspective. The real issue is the production of power needs to move out of fossil fuels. So you, you can, have to you create can, a public have a demand for you it. You can have a car which is run on hydrogen. Okay. Uh, you can have a car that oh, runs on uh, fabricated fuels. The fact of the matter is that the hydrogen, okay, now. now there was a bit of a hype about hydrogen, wasn't there. The fact of the matter is that if to produce the hydrogen, you have to use then fossil fuels, it creates an alibi. So I'm not against the use of electric cars, of course. I think it is, it is a way to get out of fossil fuels, but it's not enough. And it, we have to well, avoid I didn't say it was enough. But to your point, though, you can make things very attractive and do mm -hmm. the right thing. Yeah. There's a win-win-win. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. And the mm -hmm. unfortunate thing, and this is what I do every day, is most of the people working on these things don't understand how to make them really cool, sexy, and fun. True. And so, mm -hmm. I, luckily, I get to do that mm -hmm. and, and turn crazy ideas into something that people really want to mm -hmm. buy and buy en masse. And so, what we need to do is do more education sure. to all these scientists, science communication, but science communication as fun, like Starmus is fun. That's what has to happen. I agree. Because yeah. we need, that's the way to get people over that hump. You have to just not make your, your buying decision rationally. It has to be emotional too. It has <laughs> I, to have I both the together. For that yeah. reason, <laughs> right. was, I, I got it last year too, and I was just so thinking. In Germany, there are a lot car? of electric cars. Yeah, <laughs> there are a lot of electric cars. Yeah. But yeah. the main source of electricity comes from coal. Yeah, yeah. So and I, I live in it Florida. Is, it is. It is. I live uh, in Florida, the Sunshine State. And, and there are a lot of neighbors I have who are very happy because they think that they really think mm. that they are not polluting the environment. Yeah. They, yeah, yeah. they really believe that. <laughs> I believe yeah. Because, yeah, maybe you as well. But <laughs> so, and so it's, it's a story which can be damaging because it can create a false expectation. I think that we have to first, the first thing we should do is to solve the most difficult problem. Then the most difficult problem is uh, technologically is not to uh, produce more electric cars, from my standpoint. It is to eliminate the production of uh, electricity by fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Because this doesn't require the decision of an individual. This requires a policy which can be made at governmental level. And even that, we seem to have problems to, <laughs> to yeah. get out of. Yeah. The examples I have is what is happening in China. In mm. China, this is going to happen. China will be, see, in France, this is happening, uh, but in China, this is happening <coughs> really fast. They will stop producing electricity by fossil fuels, and they will be the ones that then will run the electric cars for cheap. 
<laughs> so I would just want to make a comment. We just transitioned from science into Politics. sociology <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. motives and okay. things like that. <laughs> and so I would say um, people are driving electric cars for the wrong reason or the right reason. Um, Ten years ago, they said, you know, it's mostly coal, it's mostly carbon. I said, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the world will transition to clean electricity. You have to do it all at the same time. Mm -hmm. You yeah. don't wait for clean electricity. No. And, so, mm -hmm. and so then the motor, okay, people say they feel better because they eat less beef. Uh, they feel better because it's vegetarian. It's actually a good thing. You don't really want to kill animals uh, to, to eat meat. But I don't care whether they feel better for this or whether it's an alibi. Mm -hmm. I really don't mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I'm not gonna discuss motives at the end. If it happens, it happens. But I, I want to add one thing. You know, I said earlier, everything's interconnected and that we need to think holistically. So, okay, electric cars have, have really reduced pollution. And from most people's perspective, electric cars are wonderful, but it's the batteries. The batteries require lithium, and the mining for lithium is destroying entire huge, I, I can't remember the East European country. <coughs> They've been fighting, fighting, fighting. The government has capitulated because they're getting money, and it's going to destroy the ecosystem of this whole small East European country. But that's a technological are, problem that we have solutions to. Yeah, but there's alternatives to lithium. Yeah, but there's, there's already a company in Nevada called Redwood that is recycling uh, almost 100% batteries that doesn't use any local water and uses almost exclusively solar power. But it's not an impossible problem yeah. to solve, no, it, I know, which replaces I know. I, I mining. I agree. It's absolutely possible not to use lithium, but we need more people to understand there's other ways of doing I it. I agree. So, just to interject, <laughs> If it wasn't for the electrical car revolution, the EV revolution, we have had the same battery technology since the 90s. There are now, because of EVs, new battery technologies, sodium ion, this first sodium ion battery plant, sodium's everywhere, we don't have to dig up the earth for that. Sodium ion batteries are now being produced and being installed in electric cars in China right now. In China. In China right now, and it's going to take it's over the rest of the world. So we are on the cusp, but we, unless we got the lithium and unless we made the electric cars, we weren't gonna get to sodium ion batteries because no one was investing. So like I said, the last time there was a new battery chemistry was in 1991, I got to use it. Now we finally have the next one. And so we had to go through all those ups and downs. Unfortunately, the path to technological progress to where we need to be, you know, for the full holistic solution isn't a linear path. Sometimes we have to go up and down to get there. And luckily we are there with sodium ion. So there is hope and we can get there. And Jane, you're absolutely right. The current mining of lithium is terrible polluting. And so as a researcher, see, okay, you know, I'm gonna say, how do you extract lithium? No pollution. But it's really awful. So, so okay, or sodium, or it doesn't matter. And so again, you look at what we're doing wrong, and as a scientist, you say, okay, you know, I'm here for 10 years, 20 years, yeah. you solve the problem. But can I say something? <laughs> sure. I have a strong <laughs> feeling that, that <laughs> probably Tony and, and Dexter can, can, can have an opinion. Uh, uh, as a strong component of marketing, I think the fact of success of ex electric cars and the whole thing is because it was Tesla, completely new brand, created from scratch, and it's strongly related to the phenomenon of Elon. Mm -hmm. Very strong relation. I don't think that electric cars coming from Citroen, even if the same as Tesla technology would have been so successful and so explosive, so revolutionary. The fact that it was Elon, who's a genius in marketing, who knows exactly how to market stuff, and it was him going parallel with SpaceX. Two companies from zero, very interesting, very innovative, and one is heading to Mars, another one renewables, and, and this was a key of success and revolution of electric cars. 
and, and it's a lot about marketing. A lot about marketing. Do you agree? I think Dexter and 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 and. Uh, <laughs> and Tony knows about how you market this stuff. You Marketing. Know? Celebrity yeah. factor, for sure, is a big part of that. I agree. Yeah, I think yeah. that has something to do with it. He made any, it cool. Any technology, if you look at all the tra transitions, it's usually a one person behind it that, or it was, has been credited with it to bring it forward because exactly. that is their personal will. That's their mission yes. in the world. And they are going to put it, give it to all of us and say, Follow me, I am yeah, the new religion, exactly. and right? You see and it happens <laughs> every <laughs> time, yeah. and you need to have that. There has to be a face to this technology exactly. that people can then associate with and get behind. And if I could add, um, climate solutions have a marketing problem. No. <laughs> because most solutions for climate and for biodiversity are less. Do less, be less, eat less, have less, travel less. <laughs> it's all about less. And less appeals to a certain proportion of the population. And so many of the very committed advocates for climate and for nature are living less. Zero waste lives, which is very admirable. No car, no children, uh, vegan. And these things are wonderful things to do more power to them who can do them, can but that is not gonna convince the entire world to take on these less <laughs> solutions. And so as a climate scientist, every day, I hear from someone saying, we just have to tell everybody it's less, make more sacrifices, be less, do less, have less. And unfortunately, that is not the way the human brain is wired. That's not why you buy a Tesla. It isn't. Because so, it's faster. It, right, it's faster. <laughs> oh, and the icing on the cake is that it's good for the environment. So we need to make solutions the easiest, the most affordable, the most attractive options to be the best, not the worst. You know, when the new Apple iPhone comes out, are they saying, well, you really should get it because it's good for you. Eat your Brussels sprouts. Get the new Apple iPhone. No. I like Brussels sprouts. Well, I, I, I do now, too. Once in relation to boiled, bo boiled Brussels sprouts, Steve. <laughs> yes. No, there's, there's 200 people lined up to get the new iPhone because it is better than what they had before. And I really believe that there are climate solutions that are better than what we have today. That said, you shouldn't buy a new iPhone every year. <laughs> no. It's like you don't buy a new car or a TV or anything right. else. Every 10 years, five years. Yes. <laughs> we well, have a big the, program to recycle. Hand in your iPhone, we will remove all these minerals that we can exactly. then reuse, recycle and they have that, luckily, into now. new technology. But don't recycle, reuse. Use glass. Reuse, reuse glass. <laughs> and so just so that you know, Elon Musk's marketing genius S, I'm going to go through the models. Oh, S. God. <laughs> <laughs> Model three in reverse. E, X, Y. Okay. <laughs> Cybertruck. C, there are two more models. Sexy car. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. It is true. It's just, yeah, he actually ch it used to be called the Model E, and they changed no, they it, to change the, it to the they Model Three because so they, 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 they he was clever. Sexy yeah. car. They expect two more models. <laughs> Skywriting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Next topic. Yeah. Next topic. We go to asteroids. Oh. <laughs> Space junk. Okay. I'm out. <laughs> this is an expert. <laughs> All right. Um, Where are we? <laughs> so something most people on the panel probably don't know is the Earth gets hit by 45 tons of rock every day. 45 tons of meteorites hit the world every day. 45 tons. And every gram of that comes through our satellites and comes past our space station. And, and those things aren't going eight kilometers a second like the things that are orbiting the world. They're going 30 kilometers a second. So there's an enormous natural threat, big and small, to everything that we've put into orbit. So that helps at least scale somewhat. Yeah, we have to be responsible for how we're making the problem worse. But don't ignore the reality of, of what also is going on in the background. However, there was zero threat of orbital debris in uh, September of 1957. And then we launched Sputnik, and now there was one up there. It, but because of all those other things, it only took three months to decay and burn up in the atmosphere. Um, but then everybody said, wow, this is a cool new thing. We could put 
I don't know, communication satellites up. We could learn about the ionosphere. We could put weapons up there, cameras. We could put uh, GPS navigation systems up there. And so Kennedy said, we're gonna go to the moon because that will kickstart the entire industry, and it did. And only after a while do we become aware of the consequences of our excitement. And we're now at the place where we have just under 10,000 active satellites in orbit around the world, most of them in low Earth orbit. Um, and uh, it's becoming so congested that it's now a real problem. And the two worst things that can happen are when two of them run into each other, because then you turn two satellites Kiss into 2,000 satellites. Mm -hmm. And when the two of them crash together, two big old dumb ones in 2009, they increase the amount of debris in orbit by almost 25% instantaneously. So we don't want them to run into each other. So that's a problem we need to work on. And we need to stop the real geopolitically powerful countries in the world from shooting up rockets to blow up satellites on purpose. Because then you also, for anti-satellite weapons, because then you turn one satellite into 2,000 pieces of debris. So how are we gonna address those two problems? Um, we need to, as soon as we can, have little satellites that go up and grab the big ones that are up there, the big dead ones, and deorbit them into the atmosphere. And you'll hear people say, oh, well, we don't wanna pollute the upper atmosphere with those rocket bodies. We have 45 tons 45, 45 tons of, of uh, rock that is coming to the atmosphere every day. So the little tiny pieces that were in the orbit are kind of dwarfed in comparison of all of the matter of the universe that's coming. But we need to get the big pieces out so they don't run into each other and cause thousands and thousands of smaller pieces. And we've got to ban anti-satellite testing. And fortunately, the European Space Agency and the uh, current American administration have both put a moratorium on anti-satellite testing and hopefully China has made some really good noises in Vienna at um, mm. the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs very recently that they agree with that because mm. that's just stupidly self-destructive. Um, Russia Is hasn't said much about it. On launching satellites, just, I mean, can you launch fifty thousand? And satellites that's the way you control it: is you can't put something into orbit without your government's permission. So the only way that you can control increasing the problem is giving launch licenses. And you need to restrict the launch license to then have a satellite that has a finite life, say five years. Your satellite can't stay up more than five years and your satellite has to be able to maneuver so it doesn't run into something else. So we can do it. And it really, and I'll just stop talking in a second, but maybe a good example is last summer, in July, I think it was, on one day we set the record for the number of airliners that flew. It was like 135,000 commercial airliners flew that day. There's only 85,000 seconds in a day. <laughs> so we launched almost two <laughs> airplanes a second. They flew all around the world, all very close to each other in altitude. Space is a lot bigger than that. Very close to each other in altitude and none of them hit each other. And the reason we did that is, they are very well designed. We have really good detectors on the ground to keep them from running into each other. They can maneuver to stay around each other and they serve a really good societal purpose. So we've built this wonderful infrastructure that allows us to launch 135,000 airplanes in a day and everybody got there okay. And we do it day after day after day. And we're amazed when an airplane has a problem. We're like shocked even though it's at a scale that most people don't understand. Mm -hmm. So we just need to extrapolate that thinking up. Instead of for the first 30 kilometers, we need to strap, put it up to the first 2,000 kilometers. It's not an unsolvable problem. Sorry, I'm gonna keep talking a little bit. Last problem is the little pieces. <laughs> what do you do with the little pieces? Because if you try and launch a satellite up to grab every little piece, you're gonna make the problem worse by launching all these satellites to grab little satellites. And the only way that I know of to bring those down is you build, take advantage of military technology, you build um, like an energy weapon, you build a laser, and you, you use um, our ability to steer really carefully through the atmosphere, and you just build a bunch of these in the uninhabited parts of the world, and all they do, day and night, is they track one of the little pieces, and they fire their laser, laser and they heat up the, f the front side of it enough that it 
it vaporizes a little, right. generates a little bit of drag, and so it starts to fall down. And if those are just running 24-7, they are just slowly increase, well, they're, they're increasing the rate of deorbit of all those things up there. But we don't have that technology, and who's gonna pay for it? Who's gonna take responsibility for it? We gotta solve all of those problems. What's the future of regulation of that? Yeah, exactly, because um, there's no well, UN regulation, it's like a lot, right? It's, 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 for example, ICAO, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO. Um, it started in 1903 as the International Committee on Navigation, and it became ICAO, and it moved under uh, the United Nations in the late 1940s. And so the United Nations is actually very largely responsible for ICAO for setting up the system that allows us to safely have civil aviation around the world. Hmm. So m one of the proposal I'm gonna give in my talk tomorrow is we should change its name from the International uh, ICAO, International uh, Civil Aviation yes. Organization, to the International Civil Aerospace mm. Organization, mm -hmm. and just give them mm -hmm. the authority and the funding. They'll, they won't, they'll tell you, we can't do that. They're based in Montreal. Yeah. They're gonna say, no way, we don't have the money, that's not our job. Yeah, but we've solved it mm -hmm. for aviation. So it's not impossible for us to solve. But we, we didn't really have a problem before because there wasn't enough, it wasn't big enough. Now. We have to actually take responsibility for how far we've gotten. And if we don't do anything, it's gonna, we're gonna build an impenetrable mess above our heads. We're, we're not there yet. When I commanded the International Space Station, in all the year of 2013, tracking everything that was up there, we didn't have to move our orbit once. In a whole year. <laughs> because it's, space is way bigger than everybody <laughs> thinks. You know, it, it, there's a lot of stuff up there, but space is bigger than that. So it's a real problem, but and we have to collectively decide kind of like how are we space. going to address it. <laughs> yeah, but it has to be regulated, right? It yeah. has to be regulated just like uh, commercial aviation. You can't have one million CubeSats, one U, two U, flying it for kilometers. You can, kilometers. but they have to, uh, be controlled how long they're going to stay up there. That's they have to have redundancy so they don't go coming. stupid. And they have to have ability to maneuver so they don't run into each other. And you need a really good tracking system so that you can let them fly close to each other. What's the regulation of Starlink now? It's approved by the U.S. government. Every single thing they've launched has to be approved by the FCC and, and the U.S. government. But Well, if we think that what Starlink is doing if we think it's wrong, then we need to change the regulation because they haven't broken any laws. No, no. However, I'm talking about the law. I'm on the flip about, side, mm -hmm. how do you the bring flip them side, down and how do you he, get on them On the out? last launch, mm -hmm. they launched a whole bunch of direct to cell phone satellites up there. Mm -hmm. If we don't need to build cell phone, cell phone towers, if we don't need to put cable and wires all around the world to everybody that would want to have internet, there's a big net gain to mm -hmm. that. So you have to balance the two of them against each other. You can't say because it's in space, it's bad. If it's on earth, it's good. I agree. But However, mm -hmm. we need, we can't have 30 Starlink constellations up there, <laughs> right? I agree. Yeah. So, That's so nice. and the regulation <laughs> as always, is lagging technology. Technology always, yeah. Yeah. always yeah. leads regulation. So I talk too much, but anyway, that's that's my opinion. You said everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's my opinion on orbital debris. <clears throat> yeah, next topic is energy. We consume more and more energy. We are energy civilization. What's the future of energy? How where, where are we going to get energy? Is the fusion reaction fusion is the future? So Pietro, what do you think? Yeah. When we will get? finally <laughs> control hours, days, the fusion reaction. So, uh, I, I work in fusion and uh, I am not in a position to tell you when. <laughs> and the more I have worked in fusion, yeah. the more I, I realized that uh, level, I don't know when this will right. take place. So as I said today, it's important to not to create uh, expectations that fusion will uh, solve the problems that we faced. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, on the short term, because mm -hmm. I mean, we should have solved it yesterday, not, not tomorrow. I think it will play an important role uh, in the long term. I think that it will uh, work in uh, some form of synergy with nuclear fission, hmm. because the two processes, uh, which are natural processes, both 
should remember uh, that nuclear processes are natural. Some people think that they are some sort of human invention. Uh, <coughs> they are, to some extent, complementary. Nuclear fusion by deuterium and tritium is very rich in neutrons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nuclear fission is very poor in neutrons, and normally um, it's one of the limitations that drives them to a very, a very small amount of burn-up. You know, a regular uh, fission reactors uh, pr um, produce waste, but the energy, the potential energy in that waste is enormous, mm -hmm. because only a small percentage of the fissile material is actually utilized. So, on the long run, I think the two technologies in the fuel cycle will become complementary. Mm. But in the meantime, this is a big question. This is what, you know, I sometimes think. I, I have engaged myself uh, in my studies and in my life uh, to, you know, the problem of global warming yeah. was known to scientists already 30 years ago. And <coughs> when I graduated, I decided to, to work on developing solutions uh, to this problem. And, you know, I was a little bit disappointed to see that uh, the path I took would have not probably allowed me to, uh, to work out a solution in my lifetime, but mm. uh, that's okay. I mean, yeah. many things we do are not, f you don't see the product in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, now I feel, uh, you know, on one side I feel the responsibility to conduct my job, and on the other side I also feel the responsibility to communicate that um, we have to address this problem by other means that I think we have. We have the technology. We have the technology, we have the, the means. And, and if I look in China, in China they are building 40 light water reactors now. Right mm -hmm. now. Right. Mm. And they do that in a third of the time that it takes to really? do it in Europe and in the US. Why? And it's the same product. How, how, how did they do? Because they standardize, because they have, uh, say, very well developed regulation, because the companies, they are organized in a way uh, where they can, uh, say, fabricate components in a faster way. It's they have, uh, say, the supply chain. They have, I think, established policies at government level, which allows them to do that. And I, I think there's, not, there's no magic, eh? it's, it's just decisions the ability to take decisions mm -hmm. and the ability to implement their decisions in a fast way. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can learn there. Yeah. There is, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we can become a little bit less arrogant and <laughs> try to learn uh, how they manage to do that. Because I think we have the ability to do that. But that's, see, in my mind, how to combine nuclear power with renewables because they are complementary and on the long run how to develop fusion in a way where it can support as a whole you know it, it, it has to become a system it's not just a competition between different mm. energy sources it's a system that we can uh, develop to make sure that we produce most of the energy uh, in such a way that can electrify all the consumption we won't be able to solve flight for the time being. Mm -hmm. right. Airplanes still need fossil fuels. The 127 planes. But uh, when you were we saying about all <laughs> these planes, I thought about all can the carbon dioxide being <laughs> yeah. produced. Can we use renewable energy sources in order to then create the, fos the, the jet fuel that we need in a, re in a renewable way? Can we make yeah. that efficient? You, you can. You can. Yes. The, qu the fact of the matter is that uh, the cost of it is astronomical. Unless you have very cheap energy. Correct. Which, which is, uh, say, something that... Which is fusion, right? Not fusion is mm. not going to be cheap. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll I'll tell you. Cheap. There, is no, there is no such a thing like cheap energy. <laughs> the cheap energy is coal, the cheap energy is, uh, is uh, fossil fuel. That is cheap. That is really cheap. Because what you do by Because we don't pay for fuels, the externalities. Yeah. What, yeah, what is true. interesting is what actually fossil fuels are the result of fusion reactions. 
Right. Sure. Yeah. Yes, from the yeah, sun, the best right. fusion generator in the world. Uh, this is the fusion <laughs> that was gener that that was transported through yes, uh, quanta, mm -hmm. <laughs> all the way to Earth, and that uh, was transformed then in fossil fuels over hundreds of millions of years, and we are turning out and and, and burning and uh, oxidizing what uh, was generated over hundred millions of years over a relatively short time. That's why it's so cheap. Right. So from uh, it requires, in my opinion, massive uh, government policies in order to, um, yes, turn around and be in a position to produce uh, electricity, depending on the region of the world, at the, at the competitive price versus, versus fossil fuels. We're okay. right next to Vienna. I was just thinking of when you were talking about, he wrote something in, in one of his books called Beyond the Pleasure Principle, I think, about um, trauma, the trauma of nature. And he was talking, and his example is, is a jellyfish, the only animal who's immortal in the world, the jellyfish that can re re replicate. And he's talking about um, <coughs> how we all, all our lives are about trauma and reliving it, rethinking it. The trauma of jellyfish is photosynthesis. The realization like, oh, it comes from the sun. Everything comes from the sun. So they live at the bottom. Of, it's not just that they live at the bottom of the sea and they, they come to the surface and they go, oh, another world. No, it's the realization where power comes from and it's the sun. So it's a really wonderful, crazy essay in uh, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. But um, I, I just like that Freud understood uh, animals and how they experience uh, the world and trauma so uh, and also you know I'm so glad you were talking about our ancestors the chimps because I keep looking at this group and thinking um, we've come so far from if we were just all chimps sitting here <laughs> thinking about <laughs> stuff but we're not I mean we're all have these ideas and it's just it's so touching to me just when you said that I, and they're punching each other and fighting it I mean we we punch each other too but we're not right now it's so wonderful let's get on the call <laughs> yeah. 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 anyway you know <laughs> so thanks for reminding <laughs> us of that okay. with your chip what, what is uh, I, I had a, a very interest uh, very I'm curious about one one uh, one thing about chimps what is the largest uh, largest group of chimps can who can survive together who can socialize <laughs> Well, normally the, the, the groups, we call them communities, they're about 50, uh -huh. but there are places where they're much, much bigger than that. Really? And nobody really knows how those, usually those big, big groups of like 100, they divide. And it turns out that early humans also were mostly groups of around 50, uh -huh. and that that's about the number where you can nicely communicate within your group with each years. other. Okay. And when you get bigger than that, then you have to kind of make subdivisions. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like a creative teams, creative yeah. teams. Yeah. Yeah. When they are hundreds, 100, yeah. they are extremely more productive yeah. than when they jump by a one order of magnitude because they, <laughs> know, they all know each other and they all trust That's each other. Right. And so communication is extremely yeah. fast. Yeah. So interesting on Bali, there's a, there's a community, communities, they're called Banjars, and that community can never be above 120 to 130 people. After that, it has to then subdivide. And so they're always rebalancing the Banjars based on the number of people in yeah, the burst. Know. They can never have a larger community than that. So hmm. there must be an explanation, just the science behind why well, for sure. this number and not an order of magnitude. How, how do you decide who goes? <laughs> <laughs> it's the our families brain, do. Oh, our okay. brain capacity, isn't it? This how many people can we actually <laughs> bring into our brains to actually know as individuals in our own community? Mm -hmm. what, what's our brain capacity for doing that? So Jane, can I, can oh, I no, go, go back <laughs> to energy, the original question? Yes. And, um, and you were quite right. We are not going to hold a breath on fusion because to get it widely deployable hmm. will not happen in 40, 50 years. Widely deployable, okay? Fission, what happened with fission? 
the cost went up mm -hmm. eightfold, tenfold. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem. Why did the costs go up? Well, you know, Chernobyl, Fukushima, uh, Three Mile Island. So what do we need to do? We need to assure society we can do fission safely and set a set of regulations like spacecraft, NASA. Freeze it in time, way early, and then say, okay, internationally, this is what we want to do, because if you don't, in the 10-year period you build a reactor and regulations change, we've all, you know, we may not have experienced, anyone who's redecorated and, I've, you know, <laughs> building big projects, change order, ka-ching, <laughs> Ka-ching. <laughs> In time. Yeah. And, and so what happens is if the regulations change during the lifetime, you no longer have the original plan. And this makes the cost skyrocket. Mm -hmm. And so I've thought about this deeply. We have the technology we had in the 1980s. It was much cheaper. It was a factor eight cheaper. So we need to do this. Radioactive waste, an issue. Proliferation, an issue. These are solvable. But in the end, uh, we need every everything, everything. Yeah, right. There's not, there's, you know, I, I'm the biggest fan of renewables, and uh, you can imagine, we need energy storage, we need all these things. And so this is, you know, all hands on deck, we need all these solutions. Mm -hmm. One final thing about energy. Energy, historically, is directly proportional to the quality of life. Yeah. Yep. And how do we get energy ecologically sound so it doesn't ruin the earth? It doesn't do all these things because fossil energy we learned in our later, recently, last 30, 40 years, this is bad. Okay, so, so the challenge as a techie nerd person is what you said. No, we're gonna do without energy. Uh, oh, the developing countries, no, you stay there. No, mm -hmm. no. You want to provide clean, good energy is a technical challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and so as an optimist, I think, well, we can do this. Mm -hmm. We can do this. We don't have all the solutions, but we can do this. And so this is, you know, I live and you breathe this stuff for 25 years. And, and as an optimist, I say we can do this, but, but we need to have a social conscious of what we do on energy. And, and what we are doing now is not good. And so mm -hmm. this, is, this goes to the deep roots of society and solutions. Mm -hmm. And I want a little plug for, for this man. He's very honest. <laughs> 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 and he gave you the right perspective uh -huh. on fusion. So I'm gonna tell you a little story. There is this wonderful physicist. He's brilliant. He's Stephen Hawking and Isaac Newton and all these people, all world and he can do whatever he wants. And he says, I'm gonna spend my entire life working on fusion. He said, but will it happen, to quote you, not in my lifetime. <laughs> so, but he's gonna do it anyway, because it's so important for society. Eventually he dies. He's at the gates of St. Peter and said, I've gotta to talk to God, this is very important. St. Peter says, you're such a wonderful human being, we'll break the rule. We'll put you in front of God. He goes in front of God and says, God, all my life, you know this, I worked on fusion, and I didn't know whether it would be commercially successful. And I always said, not in my lifetime, but it's so important for the world. Well, it happened. God pauses and says, maybe so, but not in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, no, that's okay, that's okay. I, I, I can believe that. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately <laughs> true. Well, well good. What, what we often see happening, though, with these solutions like energy, and I'm sure you've all seen this, is the more worried people get about climate change, the more people tend to think there's got to be one solution. There's gotta be one thing, and if everybody did this one thing, that would be it. So I hear almost every day from people who say, the one solution is everybody going vegan. And then I say, well, animal agriculture is very harmful, but it's, you know, 
not even not even nearly a tenth, or it's, it's just above a tenth of the issue. Then people, I've heard from people saying, well, the answer is electric cars. And then somebody else says the answer is no cars. And then somebody always says every week the answer is always nuclear. But as you pointed out, electricity is part of it. But then we also have the issue of agriculture, the issue of fertilizer. With airplanes, we have the problem where half the climate impact is not the fuel. Half of it is the particulates that come out the exhaust. And whether it's biofuels or jet fuel from fossil fuels, the particulates come out the same. So there's no silver bullet, but there's so many pieces of silver buckshot. There's so many <coughs> ways that we can change what we do that it really is all of the above. That's and that right. means that there's a place for everyone. It isn't a competition between all the different technologies and solutions. It's an opportunity to work together for that better world, which again is something that is not natural necessarily to us, but something that we have to do. If only that we could think of a festival. Right. Yeah. You know, there's, all these, it, there's, there's no one solution. Mm -hmm. And when people say, what, what can I do for this or for that or the other, you know, it's, we, we, we really need to tackle every single problem together yes we need to have this holistic view mm -hmm. and tackle them together and there's one thing and I'm going to bring this up now because I think it's very important and people shy away and nobody wants to talk about it and that is the absurdity of believing there can be unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources and a growing population of humans and livestock. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. And when I'm talking in my lectures, and I'm saying this because you said I could say this. So when, yes. I, when I'm talking in my lectures, mm -hmm. I say, okay, right now we've got around 8 billion people on the planet. And I forget the number of livestock, cattle particularly, but, and in 2050, it's supposed to be around um, 10 billion. So as we're already beginning to run out of resources in some parts of the world, what are we going to do? The metrics of what we value are completely wrong. Yeah. It's based on GDP. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, how do you measure GDP? Yeah. Yep. Well, you build a billion, you tear it down. You build another billion, increases GDP. You know, a hurricane, tragedy, you build up, increases GDP. Have a war, GDP. All these things, GDP. Mm -hmm. So think about what we really value, okay? Uh, well, some people want to have several homes and several cars, but most of us are ordinary people. We want our kids to walk down the block and go to the park and not be afraid they will be kidnapped, they won't be accosted with drug deals, things like that. We want to be connected to a society that cares. We want all these things. And so this is not measured in GDP. I'm gonna, yep. I'm gonna mess up the quote by Robert Kennedy Sr. And I'm gonna just paraphrase this. And he says, of all the things we care about, and I'm gonna paraphrase it, you know, it's neither, it measures neither our wit nor our wisdom, the value of our families, the love, the art, the history, all the things we care about. And he goes down this list of things and he says, GDP measures everything except what that matters. Mm -hmm. Now, an Obama administration, I have to deal with economists. They worship GDP. <laughs> and this is the engine. And you just want to make GDP higher. And I, and okay, economists, by the way, are not scientists, far from it. Uh, it's not a Nobel Prize, it's a medal in the honor of Alfred Nobel. <laughs> Very important. And, and the economists I dealt with in the Obama administration thought it was just, you know, they tried to undermine what the president was doing, what I was trying to do, because it doesn't enhance GDP. It, you know, this is not the way it works. And so they worship the god of GDP, and, and you try to say, no, 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 no. This is not what we value. And he said, oh, what, well, let's start with human development index. GDP on a logarithmic scale, health, longevity, education. It's a start. He said, no, 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 that's too complicated. <laughs> GDP, 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 GDP. <laughs> and this is a problem. 
and that Milton Freeman quote is the responsibility of the corporations to make profit. And this is what is unfortunately having huge sway in government. The economists have outside influence. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. And that's what also called national interests. Yes. Greed. What is me, me, me. interests? Yes. 21st century. Yeah. We need to pay attention to the Bhutan, the king of Bhutan. Yes. Ah, the happiness, happiness index. kingdom of the world. Happy. Yes, yes, happiness <laughs> index. <laughs> yeah. Happiness index. Yeah. The happiness index. Yes. Also, yep. an older quote, money is the root of all evil. Yes. <laughs> so, anyway, so, so anyway, so I was fighting this in the um, um, Obama administration, mm. and these economists are just saying, no, 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 just, you know, just. But it, so it, we it, thought it, lawyers were bad, now it's economists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, this brings me to a very interesting question we discussed at 108 minutes many years ago in Tenerife, and that we had just Joseph Stiglitz. He is an economist with a heart and a soul. <laughs> I know, he, I know. He is wonderful. Yeah, very interesting, <laughs> because he made this comment, and I asked him, I said, look, if we have an evidence that brings me to Don't Look Up, the film, mm -hmm. right, and if we have an asteroid, it's going to heat in, we have one month to take decision if we are going to defend ourselves or not. And I said, that's impossible. It will go to Congress, lawmakers, etc. By the time we decide to, to defend ourselves, we're gone. So that shows how the, the system works. Yeah, Joe Stiglitz, I, I get to be friends with Joe Stiglitz. Ah, please, please, <laughs> <laughs> talk more. Yeah. Neutralize your colleagues. Yeah, it, it has background <laughs> in physics, actually. He, he's a physicist. Oh, of course, well, that explains everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It explains everything. <laughs> well, and another economist who I, who I really appreciate is Kate Rayworth. And she, of course, created the concept of donut economics. And it's so simple, and you mentioned this earlier. The simple concept is that our economics don't include what goes in and what comes out. <laughs> And so we are living, like you said, as if on an infinite flat planet. We just assume there is infinite to go in, and whatever comes out, we can just push away where it doesn't bother us. And in reality, of course, we live on a round planet, and on a round planet, there is a limited amount to go in, and what goes out comes right back around the other side. I'm being a nerd. We live in a sort of ellipsoid, spheroid planet. Oh, okay. oh God. <laughs> we're still round. Just yeah. 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 Finite. Let's Close just go. We're, we're friends. We're Close friends. We are. We are. I'll, we'll just go with finite, Steve. How's that? <laughs> finite. And so it's a very simple concept, like Jane said, that you have to look at the whole system. We live in a relatively closed system. And so all of our, our economics has to be serving yes. our ability to live on a spheroidal planet um, rather round, than round the planet. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> See, it just sounds better when you say round. Um, it, has to, it has to be in service to that rather than us in service to it. Do economists like carbon taxes? They like carbon taxes, uh, but carbon taxes is very important, but it's not the full thing. If you put a uh, hundred euro tax on carbon, uh, you know, our Secretary of Energy did this calculation, 60 cents a gallon. Okay, 60 cents a gallon in the United States doesn't change anything. The tax in the United States in gasoline is 19.3 cents a gallon, federal tax. Okay, and no politician will ever raise this. So carbon tax is a necessary ingredient. It's, it can, it's not the only ingredient. Yeah. Well, we'll move to the last question about, about artificial intelligence. Mm. But, but I have a, do you remember there was a Kardashian of scale of civilization? So many, many years yeah. ago, the Soviet yeah. physicist was dividing the scale of how right. developed is this image. Mm. So he put human, our civilization number one because we are still with carbon, et cetera, right? Do you think that's a right scale? Energy is the only parameter mm -hmm. that we can use to define where the civilization is, is that how much energy we can manage mm -hmm. as a civilization. Are there some other parameters? Mm -hmm. so the energy is the main thing. What if you exaggerate it, because that sometimes clarifies things. What if we had unlimited free energy? Would that solve all our problems? No, that's mm -hmm. the thing. So it's not energy. Right? It won't solve aggression. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think it would help, but 
It's We're still going to find all sorts of things to hit each other in the face about, probably. Yeah. Because yeah. there's other inputs to the system than energy. I think energy is the most important one. But even yeah. if we had unlimited free energy, I think Instead, then we just take it for you granted don't and have move an on. Unlimited planet. <laughs> yeah. All right. Artificial intelligence. Last oh, topic. Oh, just a small. <laughs> My <topic>. God. <laughs> Tony, is it? What about it? <laughs> AI. AI. We've had AI for a long time. AI, it didn't just show up. AI didn't just show up, you know, a year and a half ago or two years ago. AI's been going on for many decades now, and in, there have been products, there have been ways of improving things um, and being in use for 20 years and more. I made products with AI in it 15 mm -hmm. years ago, and they were successful. We just didn't call it AI. We called it machine learning. And we didn't even tell people there was machine learning. We told them something else because it would be scary. <laughs> so now all of a sudden AI is here and everyone's like, whoa, I can interact with AI and it's interesting and it talks back to me and all this other stuff. As we heard from Gary Marcus yesterday or two days ago, it, it's, it's still dumb. The, the new form of AI or the new, now that we have the compute power, the new form of AI is really still not reasoning. It's not smart. It, we think it might be smart. We think when we talk to it, it's like, oh, it, it gets me. It's not. It's just regurgitating back what we already put into the system. There are ways of making it smarter. There are ways of making it so that it's, it doesn't hallucinate. There's all these things. But we do have this technology. It is there today. But there are many things, just like Gary said, we have to know what data is put into it, how it's trained, all these things. Otherwise, we are using a, a software system that is a huge hack. It literally is a hack. And what a hack is, is something where we, we tried something and, oh, it works. But we really don't know how it works. <laughs> We don't know why it works, but we're going to start following this thing endlessly like a, you know, some kind of religious figure. And it's not going to be that. We have to go back to first principles. We have to go back and really understand what we're building, why we're building it, how we're building it, to be able to trust it. Mm -hmm. Just like when we build a rocket or a, rocket, a plane or anything else, we need to know. And if we're building societies, we're building individuals based on AI with this very, very broken system. Mm -hmm. We are gonna, we're gonna find ourselves in a, in a real mess. That said, if we've done it right, like we've done it the last 20 years and others, those other forms of AI, we have been able to really make advancements in drug discovery and, and all kinds of other things. We can do the same thing with this new form of AI if we get it right. Dexter, you, can you imagine AI doing a music like yours? going to complete. <laughs> That's what they're talking about, right? Yeah. What do you think? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not even here right now. This is AI on me. It's a simulation. You know, I thought that was a really good point where you said about how it, it, it's it's not necessarily thinking for itself. It's what you put in is what's coming back out, right? And it's the same thing like they're using, they're trying to use chatbot to write songs and write lyrics. And, you know, I, I've put my own lyrics into chatbots and uh, it's crap what comes back out actually. So. <laughs> It's not there yet. I mean, the, the possibilities are staggering and frightening, of course, but um, not, not quite there yet, I don't think, in I think my experience. I think it's what it's trained on, you know, because the, uh, um, if you train it on Twitter, it's Twitter in, Twitter out, and it's yeah. idiotic. But imagine if you put everything you, that you had ever thought into that, mm -hmm. and you were able to individualize uh, this intelligence, it, it's massively powerful. Mm -hmm. It's I I I'm um, I'm in awe of its um, capabilities. Possibility, yeah, for sure, right? So, and even even now, if you do, uh, if you are able to um, write algorithms that that reflect your own um, uh, interests and thoughts, y they you are able then to think a hundred times more quickly because you have access to all of this stuff at once. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's incredible. Um, so I, I have um, a, a real trust in, in the future of AI. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only for what it can do medically and in many other situations, a lot of work that we are not going to do, but I, I mean, as far as who it is and what it is, I mean, we don't understand our own brains either. You know, mm -hmm. who am I and why am I like this? You know, that's already quite mysterious. So trying to understand that uh, is, um, 
uh, difficult right now, but I agree with you. It's been around for so many years. And just when it got personalized, then it became a kind of like, oh, am I having a conversation with another entity? And that spooked people out. I mean, remember 100 years ago, uh, the play uh, R.U.R., which was a, a, a play about uh, written by a Czech writer, Carol, who, who <coughs> about robots and how they were going to take over the world, and everyone was like, oh, this is 100 years ago, and, and they're not. You know, it's just very, very slow, but it has amazing potential to uh, do all sorts of things. So I think it, it will write great music. It will write great um, lyrics. I really think it will. And right now it needs a little editing because it is kind of idiotic for a lot of <laughs> Right, <laughs> But yeah. it's learning, and it's learning very fast. That's a good point, yeah. It's very fast. Well, like we were saying yesterday or the day before or whenever we met, <laughs> you know, what bothers me is what it's going to do to our children's brains. Because, um, you know, now a, a child is doing an essay for school. We had to look it up. We went to the library, you know, we worked it out, we thought about it, we wrote it down. Now they can ask AI to write an essay. My son tells me this. Mm -hmm. He says, Jane, look, this is what I asked AI to write me a poem about, I can't remember what it was. This is what AI produced. It was a good poem. So if all our children are now going to use AI to produce their schoolwork, what is that? Is that not going to make some atrophy of the brain? Unless, unless we can find a way of challenging them, mm -hmm. and and saying, okay, now you're going to do these exams, but you're sitting in this room, and you're not going to look up any, you're not going to allow laptops or cell phones or anything. But something's got to be done. Oh yeah. Well, I think you know we've we've co-evolved with our tools over millennia. Any tool that we've made, we've co-evolved with it. It can be used for good or bad. When, we, when AI first came out for chess, chess came out, Deep Blue came, beat Gary Kasparov, we said, chess is over. Chess is more popular than ever, and humans co-evolved with it and made it, and we became better through it. Same thing with Go, with AlphaGo. We're, we're playing more competitive Go than ever, and humans are getting better. I'm not too worried about how humans will use the, uh, excuse me, educate themselves with a tool because these tools, if you look at some of them, they actually help us educate us even better than our mm -hmm. educational systems today. Mm -hmm. And so if people choose to co-evolve with the technology and use it in the right way, if they just wanted to do their work, right, and they just want to shove it off to something, mm -hmm. but there's going to be students, there are going to be people who are using it to make themselves better. So I think it's just another competitive thing, but of course, some people can just go off and say, oh, it does it for me now. But I think we're gonna find out new ways of testing, new ways of doing learning that is gonna advance us, not just keep us behind because of these but, AIs. But we've got to work on those because Abs the normal absolutely. child is going to say, well, if I, you know, then I don't have to do any homework. Absolutely. AI will do it for me. Uh, abs absolutely. So it's really going to be important to design ways that that the children still have to work and still have to find out things for themselves. Yeah, and there's new educational AIs where they say they will not give you the answer. They will help you get to the answer and they will help you know, guide you. That's the you. kind of thing. That's yeah. like, and those things are already happening now, are which they? is beautiful oh, to see. Oh, good. I'm glad to know that. It, it, it's beautiful to see, and it's <laughs> incredible to yeah. watch these AI sound, trainers sounds different. who pick up exactly the things that you don't understand and help you Understand, and every you understand time there's them. a new technology, uh, people think like with books. When they, when books were printed, people uh, this is going to destroy people's minds. <laughs> they won't remember anything or be able to tell the story or, yeah, or use their brains yeah, to right. to remember. They'll have it all written in the book. Uh, That's but, cheating. Yeah. So every new technology has uh, has a challenge, and I think it's going to be. Imagine kids like now. You're kind of did you mm -hmm. teachers are doing detective work? Did mm -hmm. you use that to, or not? That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to expand people's abilities a hundred times once they mm -hmm. get into using yeah. that and there collaborating are, with it. There are just. studies that show that there's some kind of change in the brain when children are using all this technology. And yes. I, I shouldn't have said that because I can't give you chapter and verse. But I read it, yeah. and I believe it. <laughs> yes, I, I know what you, uh, I, I've read some of that as well about atrophied sort of things in terms of screen-based life. 
but yeah, yeah. and um, I don't know. I think it's um, there. There are many, many ways that um, brains can atrophy. <laughs> so, I mean, is it true that we're dumber than people like uh, several thousand years ago because we we are more specialized? Well, I'm sure. I'm sure that. <laughs> The, the yeah. rounded education that people used to have yeah. it it helps you live it helps, helps you live, live yeah. it helps you solve life's problems yes. and if we're concentrated on one thing you know it's like everything is interconnected can i say that again that it's all interconnected we need to think <laughs> holistically we need to think holistically mm -hmm. to get through life so let me interject uh, but first starting to say that um, you know faculty meeting you say everything has been said that's worth saying, but I haven't said it. Uh, <laughs> and so, about this, I'm going to. Physicists like to generalize, so I'm going to try to. It, it, this is a higher thing. Talk a tiny bit louder for me. Okay, sorry. I'm 90. <laughs> <laughs> Only. We couldn't tell. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm, I, um, I want to talk about what people are doing in a, a more generalized situation. And in the most generalized situation, we went through things. We went through, uh, you know, Bible handwritten. No, printing press is going to short. No, no, no. But you, okay, all these things. We have calculators. You forget to do math. You forget to do arithmetic. All these things. And each time. So what's really important? What's really important is that the young people have to have a new frontier to feel that they have to work on something. And mm -hmm. I'm going to quote um, a dear friend who is the co-inventor of the laser. He's now dead, but he, 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 he's, you know, and so, uh, no, I'm going to senior moment. But anyway, this, this business about struggling and everything, and he was saying, you know, yes, it's all true. It's all this, it's all that. And, and, and so, you know, it's the struggle to learn. It's the struggle to do something that really makes us grow. Productive um, struggle. It's productive mm. struggle. Yeah, if you, right. you know, <laughs> and if you have a cal, um, as you, your point, you have a calculator. Mm. Okay, we don't have to do that. We have new technology. You just go on and on and on. But as long as we have to do something, that's the most important thing that will make our brain grow. That's mm. the most important thing. We have to do something, and all these are tools they're not crutches, they're tools, yeah, right? Tools. AI is a tool. Yep. And AI it's a tool, a tool to expand our horizon, our brains to further our reach. It's like, in my view, it's like a telescope. It exactly. can be misused, it could be abused, mm. all these things. But in an optimistic way, this is a tool that expands our intellectual horizon. We, we become dependent on these yep. tools, on the other hand. We depend on we calculators. More, you know, people right. don't even know how to divide anymore. It's <laughs> no, I mean, they that, don't. That's the, tra that's the trend. <laughs> and we don't know how to navigate anymore without Google Maps. <laughs> we don't. I, 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 we we don't know. We, when I don't have Google okay. Maps, so it's are, a we, are we yeah. less? If we're going downhill because of that? No, we no, no, no. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't say yeah, that. Yeah. It's it's a, energy. <laughs> well, we will go downhill if we don't design a new education system that challenges yeah. brains in a new way. And that's what's the beautiful and thing about it. That was my point. Yeah. We have to challenge. We have the tools. Mm -hmm. so think of them as tools. And the next frontier, you have to say it's not handed to you. It's not. You don't have to think anymore. You just mm -hmm. use ChatGPT. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well. Okay, but uh, my my point is this: we become dependent. So okay, fair enough. We use them. So what? Until we don't have them anymore. <laughs> the yeah. day Shut the day up. that something <laughs> happens <laughs> when you don't have them anymore. Uh, so if I we go if we go back to nature, society, okay, so. and I look yeah. at uh, <laughs> say my <laughs> my children, and I see how uh, they use their hands their manual abilities, how they can survive in nature mm. uh, with respect to mm. my ancestors. There's a big gap. Yeah. Huge gap. <laughs> and uh, as long as we have everything available, mm -hmm. our, say, instruments available, uh, that's OK. Mm -hmm. uh, we can move on to new problems, as you say. We, we keep ourselves busy. That's true. And that's what we have to do. That's, that's OK. It's wonderful. You know, we do new things. But one day, we may discover that lack of energy 
Yeah. If we run out of energy. That's exactly what I think. Have to use if we have energy. to go back to a state where we have, we have, we are forced to consume mm -hmm. less energy, uh, not to a point of starving, but say to a point of maybe still be uh, happy, eh? because I, I'm not sure that we are happier than, uh, you know, what mankind Today, was uh, <laughs> we, know, we 20, 20,000 years ago. I mean, No, we can only be happy if we have enough. That, that's right. That's we right. need enough. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately mm -hmm. now, people feel to be happy, they have to have more than enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And more and more than mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. But that, that's, that's what tragedy. I thought. I thought that mm -hmm. somehow I would have preferred to say that we should have a basic ability. Mm -hmm. Our school, our education should teach us first yeah. to be happy alone. Mm -hmm. So Mahatma Gandhi mm -hmm. said mm -hmm. that the earth can supply everything of man's needs, but not of man's wants. Well, that's, that's what that's, Gandhi that's said. Our DNA. That's what I just said. Oh, you said it. You might say louder. You might say louder, Steve. But um, <laughs> several countries of the world, because of their falling birth rates, need to have uh, extreme immigration in order to be able to support just the status quo of a decent quality of living and our population is leveling off. It has been the, the fastest growth year was in 1960. So our population is leveling off. So if we don't have artificial intelligence that is powering a robotic workforce, then where is that workforce gonna come from? And do we then have to have an implosion of society in, in order to get to a steady state? And do we have to say uh, a, a couple billion of us need to die? because we've built a bubble that can't sustain itself without continued growth and therefore continued consumption of resources. So to me, AI is salvation. Mm, yeah. We absolutely need smart machines, just like we need whatever, steam engines or, or something that will replace animal labor and, and, and dumb human labor. Yep. But we do not have to say a couple of billion have to die. Across well, if you live in Canada and you no, shut no, no, the power no, off, we so, die. No, 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 I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about power and energy. I'm talking about people. About um, is it we're an internal treadmill to have more people? So across all civilizations, not civilizations, all across all cultures, um, when you get better, you have fewer children. Um, get smarter. And and you don't have to be rich. India's fertility rate, fertility rate means uh, defined to be formally how many women have children, 2.1 going to 2.0, right, to break even, because only women can have children, not men. So, so, so this is the fertility rate. If you look at every developed country, you're below two. Some are now below one, okay? Korea. China, hovering around one, Japan, all these things are global one. Blah, blah, blah. India has more people than China now. India, yeah. fertility rate is two, and they're not rich. Okay, so what is going on? Well, it's complicated. Education of women, mm. huge. Yeah. Education in general, huge. It's if good. a mortality rate, you, when you have a children, if you're in the lower middle class society, you don't expect half your children to die mm -hmm. in their childhood. Yeah. And so it's, okay, so, so this is good. So the population naturally will decline. So what do the economists say? My friends, the economists, <laughs> except Joe Stiglitz. They say, no, this is bad. <laughs> um, we want more young people to support more older people. Exactly. Why? <laughs> because it's a Ponzi scheme. Oh. It's a slow motion Ponzi scheme of, of, of this. And so, so, and so my friends, the economists, are saying, this is crazy. And I'm ex trying to explain this in the Obama administration. This is crazy. No, no, no. no. This, is, this, is, this is like, it's, it's, what is it like? Is it like Moses on stone tablets? What is going on here? And the natural tendency, let the population naturally decline. It will. And then you have these advisors to government saying, no, 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 you don't want this. You don't want this. And so just let it naturally happen. And so you go, okay, 
8 billion going to 10 billion. Well, this is, we're completely unsustainable. It's the same ability as a pipe dream, but at least you want to make it last longer. And so you need to do this and you need people to recognize it's okay. We have the technology and the automation mm -hmm. to say- For productivity. And the productivity. We went from an agrarian society, mechanized farming. All of a sudden, you don't need farmers. Okay, they go build factories, cars, wash machines, all this other thing, automated, okay? Okay, so you need people to have meaningful jobs. If we had mm -hmm. the social wisdom mm -hmm. to do this and let population decline, this is the only way. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and so you're, you know, this is just on a treadmill. And so since 2009, I'm in the government trying to tell people to do this. So you, you, have, a, you have a sort of interim where people are not getting jobs because AI and machinery is taking over, but we have to get over that to where you don't need the number of people because you have machines and AI doing the jobs that people mm. used to do. But right now, as people who don't have jobs because machines have taken over. That's my mm. point. Yeah. yeah. And so you need meaningful jobs. People want meaningful mm -hmm. jobs. Yes. They want worth in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, they having guaranteed live. education, forget it. And so we have automation. And so think of automation as a good thing, not a bad thing. And, and, and so let the population decline. And the only thing I would say is I'm hoping the population of economists decline faster. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I think to finish on a better note, which is yeah. getting back to what we were talking about, we have this brain that we can use. We are self-aware, we understand what we're doing, we can look to the future, we can model different futures, and we can decide which future we want mm -hmm. based on these projections. But, to end with a quote from Jane, it's only when our clever brain and our human heart come together that we can really reach our full potential. And so in the end, what do any of our problems come down to but a failure to love? And so if we look at it that way, is that not the most powerful force we have to work towards a better future? Absolutely, and computers don't have it. <laughs> That's a yes, excellent yes. point. Yes. No, no. <laughs> no we can, learning, we can take another 108 minutes on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Dave, what are you doing? Dave. <laughs> yeah. Do you want, you want to do this? This is from so 2001. 2001. <laughs> easy, easy. In this time, uh, 63 years ago, the very first man rode a rocket, took a huge risk, and then saw the world in a whole new way. Mm -hmm. and then came back down through the atmosphere and his vehicle was plumbing out of the ground and gonna crash. And just before he got to his 108 minutes, he pulled the handles and ejected out of his spaceship and it plowed into a field and he came floating down, <laughs> no, not where he was supposed to, in a, in, in a parachute near Saratov. And then he had to like go and find somebody and phone and say, hey, this is where I actually landed on the world. But it was, he took an enormous risk to try and do something new, and it took the same amount of time uh, as we just had our conversation, 108 <laughs> minutes. Thank you very much. 108 minutes are gone. So I propose that we go to the table and we continue <laughs> our discussion. <laughs> it's going to be a lively one. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations for your comment. Oh, thank you. It was so nice.